Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. How you all doing? Good? All right. How was lunch? I didn't get a chance to have any lunch. <laughs> okay. Well, um, my name is Harvey Miller, and um, I am a full professor in the School of Business at St. Mary's University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Anybody been to Nova Scotia? No? Well, it's God's country, you know? So you better visit sometime. So I want to talk about really what is just adding... Uh, or updating a little bit, uh, what is a really an old problem, but um, the motivation for revisiting that old problem is because I intend to use that old problem as a platform for expanding some formulations that I want to work on uh, in terms of incorporating sustainability in production planning and production lot sizing. Uh, I think that the sort of modification of the formulation that uh, I was able to come up with allows for at least uh, some fairly good uh, solutions when we, when we do what we call a linear relaxation of the original model, and we compare that to uh, the, the primal values to the lower bounds, we get some fairly good gaps. So I thought at least I'd share that as uh, I prepare to expand the model to incorporate sustainability factors. So the general generalized model for capacity to multi item lot sizing. And as I said, this problem has been around for quite some time uh, right now. I'll just briefly describe the basic model and then show you what I call a two-index formulation and a three-index formulation for that problem and talk about how I add certain things to it, such as certain parameters, such as back orders. Uh, you could add shelf life limits. You could add set up times and set up carryovers. And then hopefully the next uh, extension will be now to add some sustainability factors uh, to that. The basic model, uh, as we, we, we're aware in production planning and production lot sizing, is really just minimizing setup costs, inventory costs, and production costs. And we want to ensure that we satisfy the demand for the product but at the same time, not to exceed the capacity constraints. All right? So we're, not, um, we're certainly not considering at this point um, any outsourcing, any subcontracting. We just want to produce within the capacity constraints that we have. The standard notation for multi-item lot sizing problem, we're not going to get that. And I will just sort of go through the quick part. So here is the uh, sum of setup costs and, and, and carrying costs. And this is a two-index formulation, which basically means that uh, item I is produced in period T. And if we're going to meet the entire demand, then the sort of production cost is a fixed cost. So we don't need to actually capture that unless the production unit cost is time varying. If it's not time varying, then we could sort of leave it out of the model. So right now, what we really want to manage is the cost of setups and the cost of carrying inventory. Your typical capacity constraint that you do not want to exceed, the inventory balance constraint. And then this logical constraint, and this is where what I'm going to propose, or what I have proposed, this is where the magic is, right in this area right here. Okay. Uh, so this logical constraint basically says if you produce, you must have a setup. That's essentially all it, all it does. And your typical uh, Binary constraints and your continuous uh, variables, which basically say production must be greater than zero, and a setup is either uh, there is a setup or there is no setup. So the free next formulation, well, what's the big change? What's the big deal? The big deal really is just this. I introduced this variable right there, XITK, which basically that I could now produce an item in a given period, but I could target which period I'm producing for. So am I producing for the future or the past? If I'm producing for the past, it's a backhaul. If I'm producing for the future, it's inventory. All right? So it's a, a nice little way to capture that. And so what's the advantage of doing this? So now, of course, I need three indices and three summation signs, but that's okay. Capacity constraints, that doesn't change. Demand constraints, that's pretty much the same. And here's where the benefit comes in right here. If you recall from the last formulation, I had a summation sign, which meant that essentially 
it is possible that in a linear relaxation, that constraint could have a fair amount of slack. But because now the value that will allow the, the binary variable to trigger on or off is actually much tighter, it's just tagged to the demand, then as a result of that, this constraint will not have a lot of slack in an LP relaxation. So that's where the beauty is. And the standard set of constraints, okay? If we wanted to add back orders, just want to show you that, um, so you now have to come up with this constraint right here. And of course you see what we have. We still have a, a situation where that logical constraint could have a fair amount of slack in an LP lower bound, in an LP relaxation. In terms of the three index formulation, of course you see here that the constraint is nice and tight, and I don't have to add any variables B, I, T, or anything of that nature. Why? Because if K is larger than T, it's inventory. If K is smaller than T, it's back orders. All right? So I'm producing a period three for period one, while I'm essentially satisfying past demand. I'm producing period three for period five. I am carrying inventory. <clears throat> if I wanted to add setup times, so I'm just kind of showing the old and the modified pretty much. So setup times are added right here. And then the back orders, we could include that. And we see, again, that that constraint, which is a logical constraint, having that issue where you could have a lot of slack in the, in the LP relaxation. If you look at the model, there's really no difference in the look of it. So pretty much we, 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 um, we have a, a fairly nice uh, and tight model. What if you want to carry setup carry? What if you want setup carryover? So what is a setup carryover? Essentially, if we have, um, say, a period, let's say period one, two, three, and we're producing some items, let's just call this one, two, M items. So we could produce these, M, uh, these items, and at the end of the period, we could decide, okay, if this is the last item produced, then we'll carry over the setup to the start of period two, all right? And um, of course, the one that you'd want to carry over probably would be the one that's most expensive because then you have a, a savings. So you do not incur a setup cost in, in, the, sec in the next period. Now you could carry over for mo one period or you could carry over for mo multiple periods. I could have actually carried this over to period three but if I'm, going to have, if I'm going to carry this item to period three, it means that nothing else could be happening in period two, unless it's the same item, that one item is produced um, in period two. But if we're going across multiple periods, it assumes that there's nothing happening uh, in between, all right? So Haas came up with a model, but his model restricts setup carryovers to one period. And uh, to be able to capture that, so we still have in their model, in, in Haas's model, um, this, this, uh, this is the setup times. But then the, if we go to look at the logical constraint, you have that big value here, C, which is where you have the issues with slack in the LP relaxation. All right? Um, but let me just go back one second. Um, what uh, had to have been done uh, is to capture the setup carryover. They had to introduce a new variable, ZIT, which basically said that a item I is going to be set up in period T or, or carry, um, would, a setup carryover for item I occurs in period T. And you have to introduce some new constraints. The nice thing about this constraint is that all the variables are binary, so therefore I don't think those would create any particular issue in an LP relaxation. is more that constraint that is still a problem. Uh, you have another model that came out by Sox and I think that's Gao, or Gao, and carrying the same issues. Uh, certainly, you see here, that uh, is the binary variable, sorry, the, the logical constraint, sorry, that is supposed to help to trigger the set of carryovers and uh, set up, uh, setups. And they had to introduce these three sets of constraints to capture 
um, set up carryovers. Now, they allow for multiple period uh, carryovers in this formulation. Has did not allow for that. In terms of uh, my model, again, if you look, if you look, notice here, I do not have a CT. I just have the demand. So the demand, again, is fairly tight. That's already known. So it does not make my logical constraint an issue. And what I did now, rather than using ZIT, I sort of followed suit with the idea that you could introduce a three-index variable. So instead of ZIT, I decided, why don't I take the setup variable and add a third index to it? Why not? Right? So Y, I, T, Q. Well, what does that mean? It means that I will set up item I in period T and carry it over to period Q. If Q and T are the same, then it means that that item is not carried over. If Q is greater than T, then I've carried it over. All right? So rather than having a ZIT, a YIT, and then trying to figure out how to work with them, uh, sometimes we, you know, we tend to uh, just leave the formulation, come up with these fancy and complex uh, solution procedures, you know, annealing or, or um, taboo searches and all these kinds of fancy algorithms, instead of saying, what could I do with the formulation to make it a whole lot easier to solve? So <laughs> this was my approach to say, rather than me trying to come up with a fancy Lagrangian relaxation, which I did in the earlier version of this, but why don't I just see if I could just tweak the formulation a little bit. So by defining this variable, that makes life a whole lot easier. Of course, I have uh, to add some constraints, uh, but if you look at the constraints, they're all, all of the variables in these constraints are binary variables. So again, this is not um, going to pose a problem where we have a lot of slack in those constraints in an LP relaxation. All right? So that's essentially the, uh, the, 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 modify, the modification of the formulation. In the future now, I want to, because, and I'll show you the evidence that this model works very, very well, then if we now want to start adding things like uh, process options, choices, if we want to start adding things like material options, different routes, routings and so on, in this particular problem, it's good to have a, a model to start from that actually could give you some good lower bounds, and then you could start to do a search for some uh, primal solutions, all right? So I'm just going to show you some of the evidence. So what I did simply just to test the, like I said, the empirical evidence of the effectiveness of the formulation was basically to take a number of problems that I generated randomly and then use the original model of formulation, do an LP relaxation to see what the LP bound looks like, and then do a, um, an LP relaxation with my formulation and compare the two sets of bounds. All right, let's see what the gaps look like. Uh, to solve the problem, I just basically use my formulation because it's a lot faster. And, you, and when you see the gaps, you could see why it would be a lot faster. So these are some simple problems just to test uh, things out. And with the convention, what I call a conventional model is the one that have the um, logical constraint with a big factor M to trigger the, um, to trigger the set of variable. All right? So let's look at the gaps between the LP relax. Uh, the LP solutions and the optimal, and, and here are the gaps right here for that. And you could see the values range fairly high, you know, up to 25%, 26%, and so on. But for my formulation, the biggest gap here was 7.09%. Uh, uh, but you see that the values are quite small in terms of the LP gaps, right? And so I'm just going to just present solutions for you. So base case, again, if you look, you see uh, here are the LP gaps right here. All right, fairly large. Even here's one which is a 23% if you compare those to 23, 0.47%. So you can see the model certainly outperforms the conventional in that case. I just more of the same pretty much, all right? As a case here, we have 32.09, uh, 
are 3.54. Again, you see the, the gaps are a lot better with this mission. Slightly larger models, six, six, uh, six by eight. And then we see as the model gets larger, deterioration in the gaps, all right? Because model gets larger, that means your M value is getting bigger, right? But again, if you, if you target, if you're using the actual demands uh, to trigger the um, binary variable or the setup variable, then this is the kind of performance that we're seeing. So that's a case without setup times. Just the base case where we're trying to uh, satisfy demand and uh, exceed capacity. So again, if you look, pretty good gaps here. Pretty good gaps as well. And the average gap, 1.8%. Just to give you a sense of the computational effort, if we look at um, uh, simplex iterations and branch and bound nodes that I explored uh, with the conventional model, let me just look at the difference between the two for these pro for sample problems. Look at the number of uh, simplex iterations and compare over here. Now, the, now, in terms of simplex iterations, not all, all of them are lower than the conventional model. However, when you look at the branch and bound nodes that had to be explored, you could see a significant difference. I mean, look at that, this problem here. 6,000 versus 5. 1,897 versus 15. So we see really, really good ones here. All right? And again, more of the same. <clears throat> so let's add some setup times and setup carryovers. So I just ran a whole bunch of problems. So we know that uh, Sox and, and Gao, am I saying this correctly, Gao or Go? G -O -G -A -O? Well, if you look at this, uh, the gaps for these problems that I tested, look at that. And then look at the gaps over here, LP gaps. So in terms of when you add setup uh, carryovers, you're making the problem a bit more complex, right? So as you increase the complexity of the problem, so you notice I'm starting to get gaps now, you know, 16%, uh, 15%, and so on, but these are all higher in this case, significantly higher. Again, if you look here, there's the order of the LP gaps, but look at this. I mean, you're going up to 42%, 44% right here, compared to 6.6, 8.9%. So clearly, that um, change in the formulation certainly you let some, some good benefits and some more gain. Set up time, set up carryovers. You compare them. There's just no comparison between the two. All right? For the set of problems that I, I ran, if you look, minimum 19.4%, 1.1%, maximum 80.3% of an LP gap. So really bad in either context. So you know that you don't want to try to solve this problem using... Uh, you know, um, some kind of branch and bound algorithm. So, of course, they come up with a heuristic uh, for that. Do some, even Lagrangian relaxation would not necessarily give you, uh, would take a fairly long time because the gaps are so wide when you're starting out, all right? 17%. Average 36.5, 8.7, coefficient of variation. Now, you have a high amount of variability, but we, <laughs> albeit that the value are much lower. And I just... Uh, Solve 72 problems with, uh, you know, again, the conventional model. So you just, more evidence. If you look at those two green uh, columns, oh, you can't see it here, but it's showing up green over here. But um, I'm just comparing the conventional model with what I have here. The gaps are quite small compared to these over here, okay? Um, because I already showed you so um, Sox and Gal, I just has um, example with uh, has. So has basically restricts the setup carryover to just one period. And if you look at the, the values, is for, look at that. 72.25%. I mean, it's like really, really high. And then if you look at all of these here, of course, a lot lower. All right? So... That's a case of, um, of has who restricts the setup carryover to just period. And then 
Here is uh, socks and go for this for the same set of problems, and um, now they allow for multiple periods of setup carryover, and you could see here, All right? Much better. Actually, just what the formulation I presented allows me to add back orders fairly easily, set up times fairly easily, set up costs, of course, set up carryovers. And one of the nice things is that, um, that the model could be used for very, very easily is shelf life restrictions. If you have a situation where you want to limit the number of periods you want to carry inventory for, with the uh, variable YIT, not Y, sorry, XITK, if I want to limit the number of periods of inventory that I carry to three, then I would simply only consider variables that go to X, I, T, to T plus three, all right? I wouldn't go beyond that. So that's shelf life, I have some shelf life limits. If I want to put some back order limits, um, then in this case, K, if I want to limit to no more than three periods of back order, then it would simply be X, I, T, T minus three, right? So. The formulation is very flexible in that regard. And so, finally, how do I now incorporate sustainability factors in there? Well, certainly I think uh, if we want to consider, um, we may have to make some process choices that have a uh, uh, lower environment. If we have some choices, we want to look at um, what is the potential environmental impact of those different process choices or material choices. And, of and the other issue might be um, considering some investment, not just in terms of a setup time reduction, which actually helps to reduce the amount of energy consumed and the amount of work done, but also uh, to consider investments in particular technology options, which then would have different processing rates, right, um, different costs. And so if we want to incorporate that into the model, um, we need a model that actually would uh, allow us to find, hopefully, reasonable solutions without a lot of difficulty and a lot of challenge. All right? So that's my uh, presentation for the afternoon. Thank you.